Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Kent City Council workshop. Uh, today is Tuesday, June 16th, 2020. I am Tony Troutner, Council President, and this is a little bit different today because normally we just have workshops open to the public, but we are moving forward with live bro broadcasts of our workshops starting today. So very valuable information that we think is really important to share. So um, welcome to everyone that's joining us. Um, Kim, do we have everyone present? Everyone is present and accounted for. All right, so we just have a couple items on our agenda for workshop today. The first one is a parks planning and construction update. So I want to welcome Brian Levenhagen and Terry Youngman to talk about that plan. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President, and uh, good evening to council members and everyone else listening. Uh, my name is Brian Levenhagen. And I am the Deputy Director of the City of Kent Parks Recreation and Community Services Department. And uh, presenting with me today is Terry Youngman, our Parks Planning and Development Manager. Uh, we're going to go through, I'm going to go through a, a, a brief kind of recap of uh, what our Parks Capital Budget is and um, our Parks Planning Devel and Development Division. And then uh, I'll hand it off to Terry to go through some of our accomplishments over the last year or so and then head into an update on all of the projects we have going on right now. So with that, I'll just, next slide. So our park planning development uh, division is one of seven divisions we have in the parks department. They're responsible for managing public outreach, design and permitting, bidding, construction admin, close out of all of our major park improvement projects. Um, they also are in charge of writing grant applications for projects. They're in charge of doing land acquisition for the department, everything from or identifying what uh, our acquisition targets are to getting appraisals, negotiating with property owners, and then, and then closing those acquisitions. And PPD, is a, it's a small team. There, there's, there's four of them. There's a parks planning and development manager, that's Terry. Um, he's been with us uh, about a year and a half now. We're thrilled to have him. He's done an amazing job um, and just extremely productive. Um, we have Lynn Osborne, our program uh, development specialist. She handles contracts and bidding. Brian Higgins, our project manager, um, he handles dealing with uh, contractors and kind of on-site inspection of construction projects. And then our newest member, Carrie O'Connor, she's a, a park planner. She's been with us um, not even I'm around six months now. Um, so uh, she's uh, jumping in um, and handles more of our kind of public outreach and uh, early park planning duties. Um, but again, it's a very lean team, just four of them. They handle a tremendous amount of work. At any one time, they have over 20 projects going on. They, they do a ton of uh, coordination with other divisions in the department, other departments or other throughout the city. Just an extremely um, productive group and, and especially wanted to just uh, call out through the last, um, all the challenges we've been doing with COVID, they've kept their production moving and um, transitioned to working at home um, seamlessly. So uh, next slide. So everything we do in park planning and development, uh, we, we base on our park, park and open space plan that was adopted in 2016. Like when we, as a department, it's really important to us. We take the time, we go out to the community, we get their feedback. We create a plan that it really is based on everything we hear um, and lays out a strategic path for our, us over the next six years. Um, and so all the projects you're gonna hear about today all came from this planning document, which had four major goals. One, quality public spaces. The residents of Kent deserve uh, great parks. Um, we, we, we need great parks to make Kent as a livable city uh, and, and, and have uh, assets that, that our community is proud of. Uh, we set out to do a create a performance-based approach to level of service, which I'll talk about a little more in the next slide. Um, transformation through reinvestment. Um, you know, we, we had a, a huge number of assets that were failing throughout our park system which obviously wasn't a good thing, but it tr created a tremendous opportunity for us to go through some of our most um, popular and beloved parks that were uh, admittedly a little tired um, and reinvest and, and make sure that as we reinvest that these parks are now working for Kent as it is now and not necessarily Kent as it was uh, 30 years ago. And then sustainable funding is really key to any great plan actually um, achieving its goals. If you don't have the funding behind it, you, you, you can't um, do the work that's necessary to accomplish what you're trying to achieve. Um, next slide. So I mentioned before the performance-based level of service. Traditionally in parks departments, 
um, you, you look at level of service as the number of acres of parkland divided by the population. Um, this results in emphasis um, towards acquiring more land. Uh, in, our, in our situation, and we, you know, um, as I think everyone's aware, we, we had a huge maintenance backlog um, that uh, needed to be addressed. And so how, how could we actually have a level of service that adequately um, explain the, the real situation of our park system? Um, we want to make sure that uh, the level of service, um, again, spoke to the quality of the park and the recreational opportunities that we were providing. And so we came up with what we call the recreational value system, which was the, the quality of the number of amenities in parks, which again, um, focused us on reinvesting and maintaining our existing parks and then transforming them to really meet the needs of the current community. Uh, next slide. So in addition to having that performance-based LOS that really um, could keep, allow us to keep track of how well we're doing and how we're keeping up with our needs um, and providing the park services to our residents, uh, we needed sustainable funding. And so this was the model we used in the plan that kind of described um, how you fill a funding bucket. Um, most important are those rocks, those big reliable funding sources. Um, then you have those pebbles that are you know, kind of nice complementary pieces um, but they're less sustainable sources and then the sand, which are the little sources. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, finally um, passed the B&O square footage tax, which um, allowed us to have some sustainable parks funding. Um, and so uh, next slide. Um, so this is what our current parks capital budget uh, is made up of. So we have those, those rocks, the big reliable sources. We have a real estate excise tax which um, was dedicated to parks a number of years ago and real estate excise tax, tax is a great uh, revenue source for us. But the, the challenge with it is it's very volatile. It goes up and it goes down. It's very, um, depending on how the economy is doing, you know, last year we had over $4 million coming in real estate excise tax um, in the parks capital budget, which is I think close to a record. Um, so things are, can be really good. But then back in the great recession, we were under a million dollars in real estate excise tax. And so I think um, as we, in a couple slides that you'll see better kind of how the, the impacts of that uh, on our kind of ability to plan and, and um, complete our capital improvement plan. Um, and then, so then the, the B&O square footage tax that I mentioned a second ago, um, kind of it, when you pair that with the real estate excise tax, it's really two good, big, reliable funding sources. Then you have uh, your pebbles, your, your less sustainable sources. Uh, the King County Parks Levy was recently um, renewed and I think previously in the old levy, we were bringing in somewhere around $300,000 a year from that levy. And uh, with the new levy, it's right around $400,000 a year. Um, so it's, you know, it's again, it's not a, a huge source, but uh, it's a nice, nice piece. Uh, RCO grants, we are really successful as a department getting RCO grants. We typically, like, there's a development grant that you can get up to a half million dollars and an acquisition grant that you can get up to a million dollars. We try to apply for at least one of each of them. Uh, there's uh, on consent, consent calendar tonight, there's an adopt uh, resolution to authorize us to apply for three more RCO grants, uh, which Terry might mention a little later as well. Um, so it's just a, a really nice piece of our funding bucket. Uh, King County Conservation Futures Tax. This is a, a, something we use um, as a funding source for land acquisitions. Typically, we'll pair these with uh, RCO grants to pay for our acquisitions. Developer fee and lieu funding. Typically when a developer comes in and wants to um, <clears throat> create a bunch of uh, housing uh, development, our preference is that they provide recreation on their, uh, as part of their site, because it's important that people have access to, easy access to quality recreation uh, where they live. But in some cases it doesn't make sense and, and that's when we allow them to pay a fee in lieu of, you know, for example, if there's a park next door um, or it's too small to feasibly fit quality recreational space. And then you have city property actions like the, the transfer of the Cronish property from public works to parks. Um, you know, again, it's a, it's a piece of the pie and you know, like that obviously that, um, that those funds come with strings attached that they, they have to be spent on the West Hill. Um, and then you have sand, the little sources, you have donations, sponsorship, volunteers, um, partnerships, and not to diminish any one of those options. And we, we've definitely had some really nice donations over the years that have really contributed to individual projects and, and um, are fantastic, but uh, as a as an overall funding strategy, it's it's not something you can rely on. Next slide. 
So why, why is sustainable funding so important? Um, in the 1920 budget, we had $3 million a year in BNO tax uh, dollars allocated to parks capital. This was a game changer for us and it really kind of allowed us to do things that we'd never been allowed to or been a, or at least in the last 10 years or so been in a position to do. Um, it allows us to plan our projects further in advance and it, it, it makes it a lot easier to leverage funds and to come up with competitive grant applications when you can um, kind of sync your project schedule with a grant application cycle and make sure that the, the application you're um, putting in is uh, the best possible one you can. Because a lot of these grants we, we apply for are extremely competitive. So if you're not bringing your A game, uh, you're not gonna get funded. Um, it also, it's important, it's, it's necessary for us to allocate funds over several years to construct larger um, projects. A lot of these bigger park projects cost several million dollars. Um, so there, there's a lot of uh, savings that can be seen through constructing these larger projects. One, you're, you're addressing more assets at once. Two, you're, you know, there's economies of scale. You know, you, you, um, you do more work um, and more efficiently. Um, you know, the contractors don't have to mobilize twice to do something. Um, there's uh, less park downtime because again, you're doing it all at once. Um, and it's a lot easier from a project management standpoint too, because um, you know every project you manage has a certain amount of time associated, and um, the bigger projects, uh, just for the amount you get done, take less time. Uh, you also reduce project delays because you, you have the funding advance. You you can plan ahead. You know you, you can rely on it. It's really important. Um, and then you help us. Uh, it helps us maintain our performance-based level of service as our parks need renovation, um, and our population continues to grow. Uh, next slide. So um, the parks capital budget, um, you know, I mentioned before about, you know, some of those years when REIT got down below a million dollars. Well, right off the bat, we have our debt service. Uh, this is between $800,000, $900,000 annually. So this is a big chunk off the, off the top. Then we have our park operations, major maintenance. This is like our kind of core um, operational funding that takes care of all those little things that come up and you know, over the course of the year when this thing break, your smaller projects, um, you know, it's just it's vital, and this 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 money is ex extremely important to keeping our system operational. Um, and some of that money also goes towards labor. I think Terry will mention some of the great ways that our PPD team works with our park operations team later. Uh, and and so there's certain types of projects where it makes a lot more sense to use in-house crews um, to save design costs. Um, and just uh, so again, just a huge part of what we do is accomplished through this five hundred thousand dollars. And then uh, in 2019, when uh, the par Parks Department budget was cut, we one of the big moves we made to avoid having to really reduce um, recreation programming or operations staffing levels, um, we moved $630,000 of the annual, um, um, <clears throat> sorry, something popped up on my screen. Uh, $630,000 annually of, of the staff and operating costs for parks planning development from the general fund into our parks capital fund. And uh, this, this is aligns with best practice. It's similar to how our public works department and our IT department treat um, capital projects. So it is the right way to do it. And so we felt good about making that decision, but uh, it, you know, obviously it is something that comes out of that, that car, parks capital budget. And um, then, well, sorry. Um, so then major parks projects, obviously all our big projects come out of the parks capital budget and then land acquisition. Um, although I would mention that the vast majority of our land acquisition is paid for um, by grants. And typically we do match a grant with a grant. So it's generally not a lot of um, city of Kent parks dollars uh, going towards land acquisition. So next. Um, so obviously we've been through um, a lot of uh, impacts related to COVID and the economic challenges brought on by um, you know, stay at home orders. And so through the last budget exercise, uh, we parks capital was part of that. Um, we revised our budget projections for 2020 and 2021 um, down by 30%. We also um, reduced our re revenue projections. Uh, this caused us to have to kind of go through all of our projects and, and kind of reprioritize. We did this using um, a criteria listed here. Um, you know, is a project in progress or shovel ready? Is this something that can move relatively quickly? Obviously, we don't want to stop a project that we've already invested a lot of time and money into. 
uh, is this project addressing failing assets? Um, you know, I always want to make sure that we're continuing to maintain what we got. Um, geographic equity, making sure that we're spending money all over the city so that all our residents have quality access to recreation. Leveraging funding sources, uh, you know, are there grants associated with the project? And then, you know, like everything is maximizing recreational value. Is this project giving us the most bang for our buck? And so I do want to stress, though, that the projects that listed down here below are not canceled. They're still going to happen. They're just deferred and it'll take a little bit longer, um, you know, depending on how fast uh, funding is or you know, revenue comes in. Um, so, you know, like a project like Earthworks Park renovations, this was a project to, or is going to be a project to renovate the actual Earthworks Park itself. And so in, in talking through all of our priorities, where instead we're going to focus more on the canyon cleanup work and some of the trail work through Mill Creek um, but first, and then we'll get to the Earthworks Park renovation later. Um, and then Lake Fenwick and Clark Lake and Riverview Park, these are all projects that haven't really started yet. So, um, you know, if funding comes back sooner, perhaps we'll, we'll pick one of these up sooner. Um, but uh, that was kind of our methodology for, for how we worked, how we worked through that. And so now with that, I, um, I'm going to hand it over to Terry to talk about um, our 2019 accomplishments and some of our ongoing park projects. So. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, I just wanted to say hello to uh, Mayor, uh, Madam President, and the rest of council. Thanks for having me here today. Excited to be giving a presentation about the past year of work uh, and looking forward for the next couple of years about things upcoming. It's a lot of exciting work that we've got planned. Uh, as Brian has mentioned, we certainly have a full plate, but we are very much uh, excited about the, the opportunities that uh, these types of projects are going to bring to the citizens of Kent. So you can take us to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to start by talking about some of the accomplishments over the last year or so. Uh, just gonna go through these relatively quickly. Uh, we made some drainage improvements at the service club ball fields. Uh, those ball fields were suffering from uh, poor drainage on site. Um, we were able to add in uh, an underground drainage system that is going to uh, Im increase the number of hours of programmable use and also allows us to open these fields up for some general recreational use some drop-in use, which have, they've really struggled to be able to do in the past because of the wear and tear on the fields caused by uh, standing water. And so now uh, the system is fully operational. All four fields have the same drainage system. It's working very well. Our operations folks are very happy and we will eventually see that increased program uh, once we're able to get back into some of the more active recreational use uh, that's been put on pause due to COVID-19. So next slide, please. You'll recall that the uh, Lake Meridian bathhouse was renovated once and then we sustained some significant arson damage to the facility. We've now completed this second renovation project. Uh, this is just a shot of some of the interior of the bathhouse and nice woodwork. Um, and uh, that project is now complete. That project was paid uh, from insurance proceeds uh, caused by that, that arson damage. So next slide. Really exciting project, obviously, major partnership between uh, City of Kent and the YMCA uh, with the building project coming online. Obviously, the YMCA, very successful facility in its, in its opening months, but also having the landscape that supports uh, that, that building in the park. Um, you know, major improvements were made, combining two uh, park parcels that were separated before, now combined as one, Morrow Meadows Park. Uh, you know, the list of amenities that we were able to construct uh, at the site included an off-leash area, a multi-use sport court that includes both tennis and basketball, some open lawn spaces, um, a, a pretty uh, high level um, trail network that moves around the park that connects previous trails that had already exist on the Moral Meadow side and some new trails uh, now to the east. Uh, and then also there is a, a games area on the front of the, the building that's actually quite exciting. It's got um, shuffleboard and uh, cornhole and ping pong and other outdoor games that are on the porch of the uh, facility. Uh, and it's actually a really nice facility. It's got catenary lighting, so it has a lighting system uh, for uh, use at and during um, uh, sort of the winter months when it's a bit darker earlier. It's also got a fireplace. It's a really nice facility. I highly recommend people kind of go out there uh, whenever we do get into these darker days as it's a really nice facility to enjoy at that time. So next slide, please. 
really want to brag on this project specifically, Meridian Glen. You know, it's a sleepy little neighborhood park uh, over on the East Hill. Um, prior to us doing this project, the it was really in a state of disrepair. The playground had reached its useful life, was, was sort of crumbling and falling apart. There wasn't a lot of uh, recreational opportunities in the park. We didn't have a lot of options for people whenever they arrived. It was really just the sport court and the playground uh, that was all that was available. This is a project that represents a collaboration between park planning and development and our park operations crew that does some construction work. Uh, so we teamed up on this project. Uh, we also worked with Public Works on this. So we replaced the playground. Uh, we added some ADA accessibility improvements uh, to better connect people with the different amenities in the park. We uh, resurfaced the sport court. Uh, so to use a high grade uh, sport surfacing rather than just uh, exposed asphalt. We installed it. You'll see over on the right hand side that we installed a small uh, artificial turf uh, home plate area to make the, the use of the backstop a bit more sustainable. That was getting uh, muddy and, and, and uh, was remaining wet. So we added that facility to make that usable more um, days out of the year. We also installed a loop trail around the park. We were noticing as people were coming and using the park while we were under construction that a lot of people would come and walk their dogs. And as we were working with the cities on that project, we found, yes, this would be a very good thing to, to have included in the park. So it now has a loop trail that's getting a lot of use. And then another interesting component on the left-hand side, you'll see here that there's, this was a, a dead end street uh, and it had actually caused quite a few problems with the neighborhood, people parking, doing uh, things that they shouldn't, um, abandoning cars. Uh, and so we worked with our public works department to see if we could look at some adaptive reuse of that street end. And so in working with them and various options of, of uh, providing some uh, barriers to protect the users of that space uh, and um, you know making sure that we're diverting cars in the right way we were able to, to uh, reclaim this this unused dead right-of-way space uh, for a recreational use so what we've done is we've blocked it off with ecology blocks um, and we've done some striping that adds a small bicycle course uh, hopscotch and four square uh, and the neighborhood is really excited about uh, that added amenity. And obviously it expanded the recreational use of the park. So this is a really great project. We were able to do this project at a very cost efficient uh, way by avoiding a lot of uh, excessive desi design fees, doing a lot of the design work in house and, and kind of coordinating directly with the construction crew that was out there installing these improvements. So next slide, please. So that kind of covers our major accomplishments for 2019. We're now gonna move into uh, our current project workload uh, for 2020. Uh, you'll see a couple of photos here, major improvements uh, that we have planned for West Fenwick Park. So we'll get into that here in a moment. And then obviously Springwood Park is a project that's been on our list for a very long time is in need of master plan. So let's kind of jump into to some of this content. First project we'll talk about is the Riverbend Driving Range Expansion Project. Uh, you've seen uh, an item already come through council for uh, phase one. This project is broken into three distinct phases. Phase one is really focused on the landscape portion of the work. So that would be converting what was previously an artificial turf field. We're converting that to natural grass that's a bit more sustainable for our golf crews to be able to manage that type of facility long term. Though we would also be at, uh, have added an irrigation system to that field. Uh, as part of the phase one project, we've also moved the net line uh, to the eastern property boundary, which then opens up our ability to add some additional stalls to the building. So like I said, phase one is really the landscape portion of the work. That project is reaching substantial completion uh, end of this month, early part of next month, and very excited about getting to that. You can, if you ride through the Green River Trail, you'll see a nice green lawn starting to pop up. Uh, there at Riverbend, which is a, a, a sign of progress on that project and, and all the netting is, is being erected as uh, probably as we speak. Phase two is a coordination project between us and Public Works. Uh, as you all know, Meet Me on Meeker is a very uh, important project for the city, really changing the character of that corridor. Um, the Riverbend stretch was, one, was next on the list after the East Ethos project completed their section. So working with ECD and with Public Works, uh, we have participated in uh, the design of that project and we were able to uh, include the Riverbend driving range parking lot as part of that Meet Me on Meeker project. So as that project is completing the Meet Me on Meeker um, improvements on the frontage, we are also completing the parking lot expansion portion of our driving range project. So that's phase two, that's under construction now. We hope to be complete with that uh, scope of work by the end of the summer. 
And then phase three is going to be on pause because we would like to get this facility back open to the public so that we can generate some revenue through the course of the rest of the summer as soon as that parking lot portion of work is done. Uh, and we will be putting out the building expansion project to bid uh, likely sometime in August or September and going to construction shortly thereafter, just after the busy season for the golf course is done. So we want to get them as much revenue as we can during this busy season, then we'll, that facility will go back to sleep again as we go under construction for the, the expansion of the building, add those 14 stalls, and then reopen it for the next busy season. Projects funded through golf capital. And I've already kind of spoken through the status of the project. We're finishing up phase one. Phase two is under construction now. Phase three will be uh, starting at the end of uh, an early part of fall. Next slide, please. West Fenwick Park renovation project. You'll see this item is on the council agenda tonight to award the bid. We're really excited about this project. Uh, this kind of represents the first of many projects to come as it relates to doing more holistic park renovation projects. I think in the past, because of sort of the funding gymnastics we uh, would put ourselves through with smaller funding sources, we really couldn't uh, assemble a larger scope of work. West Fenwick, this project really represents the first one that we're doing uh, as a park planning and development team that takes, you know, more or less the entire park site and looks to do all the capital replacement needs and then also re envision some new uh, facilities uh, to breathe new life into this park. So just talking quickly about some of the new uh, pieces that we're going to be putting into this park. The central lawn area really suffers from uh, poor drainage, bad soils. Uh, so there's a big emphasis on the dark green. Uh, rectangle that you see there in the center. We're going to be uh, amending soils and then installing uh, new turf. Uh, that's a natural turf area that will be irrigated. So it'll be open recreation lawn space. Uh, that's about the size of a football field. And then just to the west of there, you'll see a lighter green color. Uh, that is a multi-use games area. So this is an artificial turf field that's a little bit smaller scale. Uh, it has a uh, uh, soccer goals in it. So it's meant, it's, it's kind of a futsal court. It's meant for sort of small scale soccer games, uh, but it is uh, an artificial turf field. So it's, it's set up uh, more easily for year round use in the wet season. Then uh, we have, as, as we move south from there, there's some ADA accessibility improvements sort of taking us from the main parking area uh, uh, and then moving east along the park towards the basketball court. So there's some ADA upgrades, uh, some non-compliance issues that we're going to be dealing with as part of this project. There is a new picnic shelter and all the associated amenities with that picnic shelter. And then the piece in purple is, is something I really want to highlight is it's a really uh, it's, it's a quite innovative uh, design idea for the playground replacement. So that playground has reached its useful life. And in coming up with uh, some designs for that, uh, we are going to be putting in a and I'm going to say go ahead, go ahead and go to the next slide so we can show the pictures of that. But it is a shoots and ladders themed playground really uh, an idea that we've been working with playground manufacturers and our design team on. It's really exciting. I think that, you know, this is a, a playground that will be appearing in catalogs. People will be looking at this as an innovative idea for, for future playground uh, design ideas. And so this is something that's going to be uniquely Kent. And I think that other cities will be uh, looking at us and saying, wow, that's something that's really impressive. Um, just Kind of funny, uh, as a design team working with our designers and some of our in-house crew, we have play tested it and it does work. Um, so you'll actually be able to play the game of shoots and ladders uh, using the facilities and the play structures that we're going to be installing here. So if you go back a slide just for a moment, please. So just wanted to talk quickly, the construction schedule for this one, uh, we are with the award of the item tonight, we would be planning to go to construction in the early, early part of the July. Uh, and it would be closed through uh, through the end of the year. So uh, wrapping up construction sometime in December 2020 or January 2021. This project is funded uh, almost exclusively with parks capital funding. We do have two uh, grants from the Youth and Athletic Facilities Grant Program from RCO. Um, and like I said, construction is anticipated to start first week of July. So really exciting project here. If you can move to the next two slide. Yep, there we go, thanks. Next project I wanted to talk about is one you're probably also familiar with, Kent Memorial Park renovation project. Uh, just recently received funding to get this project started in earnest. Um, this is another project that I think represents the need for capital replacements within our system. We have outdated facilities that really just need to be re-envisioned for the current population of Kent and serving uh, uh, a more diverse uh, set of recreational needs that we're finding in our communities. 
the, one of the main emphasis of the project is art right field and the replacement of art right field converting that from a natural grass facility to an artificial turf facility similar to what we did at Hogan Park. Uh, those improvements will allow us to program that facility for more months out of the year, so it will, it will both increase our revenue potential of the, this facility on the programming side and will also have some significant uh, reductions in operation and maintenance expense. Um, for park operations. So it's kind of a twofold benefit. We get to increase our revenues and we get to decrease our expenses by making this initial capital investment. So big emphasis on that project and all the associated amenities around it, um, you know, with the bleachers and the backstops and the lighting system. So everything around that facility would be uh, replaced and new. And as part, of the, uh, as part of this project, we're also looking at the space to the north right now. It has two uh, less formal uh, ball fields in place there today, but we definitely want to have a robust conversation with the community. There's a lot of multifamily uh, apartments that are nearby. Again, changing demographics, more densification of downtown. So we really want to re-envision that space to uh, be something that serves more of a general and open recreational use, but definitely something that we want to have a lot of conversation with the community about before we make any big decisions there. Um, Wiffle ball field remains, the playground that was just recently replaced, that remains too. We will be looking at, um, there's a project that's headed by Public Works, which is the Mill Creek Reestablishment Project. You'll see that bridge there on the east side that connects the apartment complexes to the park. So we're well coordinated with them to uh, accommodate the landing of that bridge within the park. And then we'll also be looking at a bunch of other infrastructure needs, uh, restroom replacement to the south of Art Wright Field. And then we know that we've got some real significant circulation and uh, ingress egress challenges with the parking lot. So we'll definitely be looking at some optimization of driveway access, circulation through the parking lot and so forth. So a comprehensive project. We're really in the early stages of this project. We're just planning this project now. So kicking off public engagement, as we all know, public engagement is gonna be very challenging in a post COVID-19 world, but we are definitely working on some innovative ideas about how we can reach out to communities in an online space and also non-online means because we know everybody doesn't just log into their computers to 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 uh, be able to plug into projects. So we want to look beyond just uh, websites and social media. We're looking at direct mailers. And I think that, you know, this same logic applies to the, all the projects that we have because they all require some amount of public engagement. And we're really having to think outside the box in that respect. This is a project that has a lot of potential in terms of grant funding. We uh, just recently applied um, or, or with the item tonight, we'll be applying for uh, local parks grant and the youth and athletic athletic facilities grant, uh, and those present those uh, mock presentations are starting next week. So that process is already underway. We're very hopeful that this is going to be a very strong project within that uh, uh, within that rubric. Next slide, please. A question? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> is that for me, Madam President? Yeah, go ahead, Councilmember Thomas. Thank you. So. Let's go back to that slide there at Kim Memorial Park. So, you know, I play softball there almost every year. We have a men's field and a women's field. Uh, the thing I guess I'm concerned about, Terry, is the fact that we seem to be getting rid of ball fields. You know, when we built Showware, we got rid of six T-ball fields. And now we're getting rid of two other fields that uh, are used every night, every 45 minutes. It seems like there's games going on. I guess I'm just expressing my concern and see what your reaction is at this point. I think it's something that we have to put out into the realm of broader public engagement. I think that we do understand that those fields do uh, receive use, that we know that they're programmed, we know that we have drop-in use, but we also know that there is a growing need for open space downtown. When we look at the availability of parkland within downtown Kent, there's really not much that we have left in terms of, of open space. And so uh, I think we have to look at every opportunity that we have within the vicinity, vicinity of downtown and being able to activate these spaces for more general recreational use as opposed to very specific programmed use. I don't want this graphic to be misleading in the sense that those fields are absolutely going away. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, this is very much conceptual. It's just intended to start a conversation with the community around it, and we would want to be collecting feedback. If we get overwhelming feedback through that process that people feel very strongly that those fields need to remain, we will do what the public tells us to do. That's what Parks is in the business of doing, is responding to the community needs. So 
this is really just a conversation starter to, to get it out there in the public, to get people to think about the space. We want them to think about the space a little bit differently than they have before, because we know that the needs for recreational uh, and open space downtown is going to change uh, and is continuing to change. I understand that. And so I'm giving you my initial feedback, but I'm sure the community is going to be kind of concerned because many of us remember promising many years ago, and America confirmed this as well, that we were going to replace those six fields that we took out to uh, build showware. And now we're talking about possibly taking out, you know, two more that are used constantly during the summer months when it's nice out. I'm, I just, I'm just giving you my initial feedback and, and uh, reaction. So uh, no more, no less. If I, if I can jump in and make a comment really quickly too. I think what I'm noticing though, that is very positive about this is that these turf fields that we've put in are multi-use fields. Yeah, so yeah. we've taken out, you know, we we're not just making those ball fields, you know, they have the ability to play other sports on those fields as well, which I see as a very positive thing. I understand, to, Madam Chair, but, uh, you know, looking at this diagram here, you've only got one major baseball field and that's hardball and that's used constantly as well. Uh, we get, you know, not just kit community, but other communities around us come in and play ball. We have tournaments that we host there. Um, do you see where I'm coming from? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm way off here. No, I, I think the perspective is important. Like I said, I think we have to get into this with the broader community. I think we've, we've, we know what some of the current uses are. We don't know what the potential uses are. Um, and so I think we've got to look into that. I honestly think that as we go through the public process, it's likely to come out as some hybrid. I think maybe we hold on to a field and then we're able to program it for some of these more sort of open general recreational uses that are not so heavily programmed for uh, active sports. So I think it's a valid, I think it's a valid perspective. I think we've also got to explore the availability of fields that we have elsewhere within our system that are underutilized currently. Um, so we do have those types of fields out there. Uplands is one, uh, North Meridian is another. So I think all this sort of has to be taken into consideration and looking at the entire system as opposed to just this specific facility having to take on all these different uses all at once. Madam Chair? Yeah, um, Terry, if you don't mind, we've got some people that have questions. So um, Council Member Boyce, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I'm kind of in with Les as well too, right? You know, I mean, I know the the high school you this field too. And so likely, you know, you're gonna, you have your plan in place, you would think you will be out getting input from uh, the community uh, before we, uh, go so far ahead. I mean, like you're going to take the plan to the community versus maybe gathering input prior to um, putting your plan in place. So I'm kind of with less. I mean, I think, you know, I was very upset when they took the field away with the show air because the kids, I mean, my kids play ball there and all of a sudden the soccer ball, the field, everything went away and they, they never been replaced. So uh, I must admit, I have the same concern that uh, Councilmember Thomas has as well, too. Just want to make that be noted. Thank you. Councilmember Fincher, did you have a comment or a question? Thank you. No, I was just going to basically say the same thing that Councilmember Boyce said. You know, not only was it the t-ball, but it was the soccer and the adult baseball, too. I'm sorry, adult softball that was played there. But the to your point, the utilization has had really climbed over at Russell Road after they made the changes there. And, you know, they did things like having a movable mound so that they can make the fields versatile. But I think it's good to bring the, uh, to bring the, the community in earlier rather than later, just to make sure we are building what they're going to use. Uh, my real question though, was back on the, on uh, West Fenwick, Will there be changes to the parking? Will we still be able to utilize church parking lot across the street? Because that park gets really busy and uh, parking is, they're parking on the grass and everywhere there. So will that change at all? 
Uh, great question, uh, Councilmember Fincher. Uh, we are not making any major changes to the parking lot at West Fenwick. It will get a, a simple seal and stripe. So just a bit of a sprucing up, up of our parking lot. And we are still uh, engaged in the same agreement with the uh, church across the street. So that parking is still available. We're working with Public Works and our transportation group to try and make the crossing of, of the road a bit easier and a bit more easily facilitated. So that's something that's in progress too. I don't know that the timing of that will be perfectly synced up with the completion of the project, but we are working towards that end. Okay, thank you. Council Member Larmer, did you have a question? Yeah, so my children are younger, so I don't remember necessarily, you know, the, the fields that were lost with show wear. So I just, you know, maybe the historians <laughs> can help me here. So we lost six fields with show wear. We're talking about potentially losing two more with with here in this design. Um, have we gained any fields anywhere in in sort of these this turf reuse? Has there been like a net gain at all over so, the years, or are we just down eight total? So I mean, one of our goals with um, you know starting with uh, the Hogan Field replacement, uh, converting that baseball field from natural grass to synthetic turf. Um, is to, to you greatly increase the amount of play. So when you have a natural grass field, um, you know, it's only used six months out of the year or in KMP's um, case, it really only gets heavy baseball use for three months out of the year. So we're gonna, we're gonna <clears throat> when we do these synthetic turf field conversions, um, I think at Hogan, we, we ended up having 300% more use on that field. So not only is it, it's easier to operate, um, you, you get more concentrated use, you get a ton more use. And then we also, increased revenue at uh, Hogan Field One by 250%. So there's a, a lot of advantages um, to moving towards the, the multi-purpose fields that, that uh, again, like, you know, right now, KMP is predominantly baseball only. Um, and, and so we're opening up nine more months of, of use throughout the year. And I think uh, just in touching on the, on the, the back two fields, um, you know, we, we, our intention here also was just to kind of leave this as an open kind of um, space for conversation. And we didn't want to kind of, uh, you know, too heavily influence uh, people's opinions moving through the public outreach phase. Um, so as Terry said before, it, it's entirely possible that we will still have um, two, two fields there or one field there, um, or, or it'll be something more open like this or an open lawn with backstops. Um, there's, there's a lot of different op op options there. So um, I think uh, it's all great, great discussion and um, certainly something that we know we're going to have a robust conversation around. Ma Madam Chair. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Councilmember Thomas. I, I guess one of the things, Terry, that comes about that maybe you're not involved in so much, but it was the pledge by certain politicians including myself, that we would find replacements for those fields that we took out. And it, and it wasn't just <clears throat> the six, like um, Council Fincher, Councilman Fincher was talking about, is it was the soccer fields as well, the six little t-ball fields. I could see where your Kim Memorial Park field, you might have room for a ladies uh, softball field in that northeast corner but I'll let you guys try to figure that out. But if I remember, and Madam Mayor, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, it seemed like in one of your state of the city addresses, you kind of made a pledge too to re replace those six fields. So um, Council Member Thomas, I will um, tell you that I would love to come up with some ideas. I have never committed to that. I think it was committed to this community um, at some point, and I have some thoughts about options, but they're way out in the future. <laughs> yeah, and I understand that. I think I know where you're going on that. So I, I'm not holding you to you. And I know you didn't commit, but I kind of did. So I'm just kind of concerned. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think one of the points Brian was trying to make, um, bring up, and I think that we're seeing that here is that I don't know how much Hogan Park was necessarily used as a soccer field, but now with this resurfacing, you know, they're able to use that field during the winter months when it's raining for things like that, it, that it wouldn't normally be used. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's, um, it's not necessarily replacing a field for a field, but it's giving you other uses, including using that as a soccer field. 
I understand that, but I also know that we took out zero ball fields when we, with Borden Field uh, when we built the Kent Downtown Station. So um, there's a lot of things, you know, I'm just thinking about the community. I don't know how this is going to go. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get some criticism, but, uh, uh, you know, you've got good rationale for it. So, okay, let's hope for the best. Well, great discussion. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? If not, I'm sure there's a few more um, projects that we need to get through. Um, so if everybody's okay um, to continue on. Absolutely, I can take it from here. And a, a great discussion on this point. Uh, you know, I just wanted to reassure you that this kind of a graphic, there's really been no design work. This is intended to be a talking point for a public engagement process. So I don't want to give the wrong impression that we've made a bunch of progress on design. This is definitely the early, early phases of this project. So next slide, please. Uh, Kearsan Park renovation. I came and gave an update uh, on this project several months back. So just really quickly, this project, this is a, the downtown park that's uh, um, near uh, City Hall and Centennial. Um, small, small space, but I think it really can do a lot to change the character of downtown. Uh, this project would be focused on the placement of the lunar rover replica and the astronaut, which were, are currently housed uh, over in Kent Station, uh, on display. So finding a permanent place for those to be. Uh, you know, on display for the city, for people to come and visit the facility. To complement that facility, we, we would be looking to install um, a space-themed playground element. You would see that up there in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, so that would be sort of this campus of space-themed play with the lunar rover, the astronaut, and a play structure, and then some plaza space um, with outdoor lighting. We would also be expanding the lawn space there to sort of open that up. It's kind of a, a bifurcated uh, lawn space today. It doesn't really, it's not very contiguous. And so this would really be to open up that lawn space to be more general. And then opening up sight lines too at the at the corner of the park at Gow at Sack and Street that really suffers to, to is kind of a hidden space. It's kind of walled off uh, for at, in terms of access. And so looking to open up this park um, and, 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 and put some investment into a park that's it's sorely needed it. Um, this project is very much contingent upon uh, the fundraising campaign that we've been talking about. Uh, so we have set the design up such that um, we can move forward with certain phases of the project uh, and kind of contingent upon how that fundraising campaign goes. Obviously things are complicated now with COVID-19. I know that the economy has very much changed. And so we'll be following that storyline very closely as we start to move forward with the design this summer. Um, but just keep in mind that any sort of scheduling of this project is, is contingent upon the availability of that uh, fundraising, uh, those fundraising and philanthropic dollars down the road. So next slide there. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Council Member Thomas. Uh, could you go back one slide, please? Council Member Larma is always talking about some historical stuff, but this little uh, park used to be uh, actually uh, the uh, was the original site of the city hall, and uh, then years ago well, they painted a big Russian mural on the wall there that you can see uh, would be on the northeast corner there. And then they had the red bricks. So because this was Kyrgyzstan Park and the Russian, we we named this Red Square. So just a historical little perspective. Thank you. Council Member Larmer. Yeah, I know um, in some like early discussions when this first came to committee last year, uh, there was mention of going beyond the existing building and possibly putting turf. We don't own the piece of property that the penguin sits on, but perhaps just turfing that and working with the owner and getting permission to do that. Um, Cause right now it's just that awful undeveloped uneven <laughs> lot in the middle of our downtown. Um, is that still a possibility? And is that a place we could start? Even if you know, like we run, if we have some funding issues could that maybe be the first less expensive thing we do to just sort of bring some value to that corner? I, I think that that's a great idea. It's definitely something that we looked at in the concept design phase. You know, I, I think it really, we really need a willing participant uh, in terms of property owner. Um, but I think in terms of low hanging fruit and being able to have a, um, a sizable impact on the character of downtown and providing more green space, which we know we sorely need, uh, I think it is a great thing for us to explore. Um, 
So yeah, I think it's a great idea. It's definitely something we're still considering. It's just a matter of, do we have a willing uh, property owner? Yeah, thank you. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, go I'm, ahead. Uh -huh. Thank you, Terry, isn't it really a problem of multiple owners of that space? There are two property owners, yes. And they don't get along. I do not know the relationship of those property owners. Well, I guess they can't come up with an agreement of what they want to build there. Then maybe they would agree to let us put turf over it <laughs> until they do. Or use it for parking spaces. Something. Which we need in downtown. All right, great suggestions. Thank you. Um, I can kind of take us forward if you want. Yep, please, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next slide is Springwood Park Master Plan. As I mentioned before, uh, this neighborhood park, um, it, it desperately needs some investment. This is a project that's been on our list for, for a number of years uh, to proceed with a master plan phase. Uh, so we are hopeful that we would be able to kick off a master plan phase this uh, sort of later this summer or early part of fall 2020. Again, COVID-19 has created a very challenging environment to be able to go and meet with the public and engage in personal meetings and those sorts of things. So we're having to be creative. We're coming up with a strategic plan to be able to figure that out. Um, so I'm not gonna give a ton of detail around this project right now. Just know that this is not absolutely not something that's dropping off our list. In fact, it's a very high priority uh, in light of what's going on in the world. You know, This is a, an incredibly rich and diverse uh, part of the of Kent, uh, you know, it's I think it's reflective of the growing diversity that we see within the city of Kent, uh, between multifamily and single family residential and various communities that that use this park every single day. So we see a tremendous opportunity to make a lasting impact on these neighborhoods. Um, we see this as very much a, a good a, a candidate for future RCO dollars. Um, and again, we're in the very much early phases of this. We would be launching a master plan as a first phase and then moving directly into a design, hopefully by summer of 21. So we move to the next slide. Salter Vista Park, this one's over on the West Hill. Kind of, again, kind of talking about geographic equity and making sure that we're investing dollars around the city. Um, the facility, this is another project that represents capital reinvestment. We need to sort of replace the facilities that are there. But complicating this project further is the fact that we have uh, a large amount of stormwater flow coming off uh, of Pack Highway due to changes to the stormwater system there. So the park is now receiving a lot of those flows and it's causing an erosive condition within the park that we need to go in and arrest that damage and, and, and really use that as a catalyst to fix the park up. And so uh, the, pro the project is kind of twofold, capital replacement, let's deal with the playground, let's deal, deal with ADA connectivity, but let's also deal with these stormwater challenges that we're faced with now. Um, the idea is that we would be moving into a planning and design phase this summer with construction uh, tentatively scheduled for the summer of 2021. Next slide. Van Dorns Park, uh, Lower Russell uh, Levy project. Um, very familiar with this project, I'm sure. It's been a long time coming to get this project finally under construction. Really excited about um, the finished product of this project. It will take a couple of years for us to get there. Um, scope of work includes obviously the setback of the levy through the stretch from 228 up to 212. Some of that work completed in, in phase one, which is wrapping up now, and now phase two, which is about to get underway. Uh, this project will permanently close Van Dorns Park in its current location and then move that facility to a new location, which is shown here with the, uh, the rendering. Um, you know, has some really exciting elements to it, the Mount Rainier playground, uh, multiple picnic shelters, some expansionary components from the existing site today, and then also the Green River Trail will be fully separated from the vehicular traffic after this project is done, which is really exciting uh, for, for the Kent Valley Loop Trail system. Um, July 4th is the last weekend for Van Dorns Park in its current place. So that's a, that's a date to keep in mind. We know how much this facility is loved by the public. Uh, although it is challenging to get out and gather in shelters and things like that right now, I think this is a, an important date to keep in mind. So construction is anticipated to start on July 6th after that weekend uh, and will last through August of 2022. So this is multiple years of project. These dates are contingent upon on-site construction and any unforeseen conditions that they may face. So obviously this could go out further. This is the best guess that we have. The project is um, being managed and funded by the King County Flood Control District and that does include all of the park elements as well. So next slide. 
This is another segment of the Green River, uh, Green River Levy project, a signature point. This project is in the early phases. We're really only approved for 30% design right now, but it, it stretches from uh, the western boundary of the Riverbend driving range and goes through to SR 167. All of this is along the, uh, the right bank of the Green River Levy and goes through Riverwood uh, Apartments and the Signature Point Apartments as well. We're working uh, collaboratively with the Public Works Department as this project has some of the most impressive sort of recreational trail uh, components within the city. And so we want to make sure that uh, whatever impacts um, are sustained uh, due to the fact that the levy is going up and moving back are, are mitigated to the extent that they can be uh, to make sure that we have the, uh, a nice public recreational space along this trail system. So this, what you see the image on the right is our conceptual design that was done last year and we're just proceeding with the next phase of design. Um, for those park and recreational elements along that project. Next slide, please. This is a quick capture of some of the small projects. Everything that we've kind of talked about up to this point are sort of these medium and large scale projects that are managed through consultants and contractors, but we do have some contracts that are managed through small contracts, service agreement contracts, and in coordination with our park opera operations team. Uh, so just running through this list really quickly, because I know we're kind of running out of time, uh, but we are wrapping up construction right now of a loop trail going around the service club ball fields. That's something that's called out with the parks and open space plan and just adds another recreational component to that project. You know, as parents are taking their kids to the game and letting them play, that it's, it's something for them to do to have a loop trail to, to get some fitness in while they're watching their kids play. We're also going to be going under construction on a playground replacement project up on Scenic Hill. So Kiwanis Tot Lot number three. Uh, that playground, you can see it there in the bottom right hand corner. That's the rendering of the playground replacement we're going to be putting in there. Uh, we're going to be adding some nature play elements to that park as well and just upgrading site furnishings. We're also uh, developing a, some really basic design concepts for Chestnut Ridge. That's the next one on the list for us to go and do a playground replacement similar to what we're seeing here at Kiwanis 3. Uh, we are currently under construction on the uh, Hogan Field number one, which is the one that was converted to artificial turf. We're installing dugout roofs there. So that's kind of the, the finishing component of getting that project done done and increasing some of the programming potential of that park. And then also a small project, this is a, uh, related to the fee and lieu uh, reallocation we brought a couple of months ago uh, to put in a picnic shelter at Wilson, Wilson Playfield. That project's moving forward with qu equipment selection right now. And if you can move to the next slide, please. And then just a few more projects here. Uh, we're doing some underpass work on the Green River Trail as it goes under 212. This work is kind of coupled with uh, the uh, Lower Russell Levy project and also facilitating some of the trail detour work that we're doing there. So it's, it's improving the condition of the asphalt pavement under, uh, under the 212 underpass for the Green River Trail. We're also uh, working with our park operations team on doing some cleanup work on the canyon. Uh, this is something I know we've been talking about for a while. Uh, but we are finally getting some contracts in place. There is a solicitation up right now for us to uh, hire a vendor to come in and help with some of the trash collection uh, and hauling. So that's out there right now. We're, we're getting good responses on that. And then we'd be working with our park, park operations team to create some distinct access points. As we know, uh, getting into that canyon and getting out can be quite challenging. Uh, in addition, we're doing some upgrades to our gateway projects. You can see here some of our park operations crews working on these gateways and beautifying the landscape, pressure washing, installing irrigation systems, and upgrading some of the, the planting palette that we see at these places. So that's a, a component of these city gateway projects. But in addition to that, we're also looking at some branded uh, gateway signage uh, and, and that we're looking at across the city at some key locations where we may lack some identity um, uh, as some, as some key locations, like I said. So if you can move to the next slide, please. Just wanted to quickly highlight that we don't just do work within our department. We also work with other departments. Uh, we, we work with public works uh, very frequently. Every week we seem to be working with them on levy projects, uh, as I described in some of the previous slides. But in addition to that, we're also working with them on the transportation master plan, playing very much an active role in that process to be sure that as we're re-envisioning our transportation system, we're also thinking about neighborhood connections to parks and, and making sure that we have options for people to arrive at the park, not just through single occupancy vehicles, but also through other means as a pedestrian, as a, as a cyclist and so forth. 
Um, we recently completed a section of the Frager Road side of the Kent Valley Loop Trail system. That's the Downey Farm Trail. Uh, it's a separated trail that essentially moves from Old Fishing Hole to approximately uh, 516. We are also playing a very active role in the Fourth and Willis Roundabout project. As you know, that project is, is moving to construction later this month uh, with the improvements within the right-of-way uh, and the transportation system. But as part of that project, we re-envisioned some of these landscape spaces in the center of the roundabout and some of the placemaking elements that uh, are, are really sort of character defining for, for this, this very important space downtown. Um, and so the parks department has been the one that's actually played the lead role in the design of those landscape elements. And so that includes the renderings that you see here on the right. We played very much an active role in the public meeting series as uh, Public Works was sort of shepherding that project through a public process. Uh, and we are continuing our work uh, as, as this project moves into construction, we'll be, be providing the review of the construction as it's happening and making sure that those improvements that are part of that project are installed appropriately. So doing some on-site inspection and coordinating with the contractor and with the public works project management staff. But in addition, we're moving forward with the design of the two greenway spaces on the north and south of Willis and looking at those for potential trail connectivity to the inner urban trail and also just to make those a nice green space for the residents that live to the south and some of the, the business owners and the residents that live to the north as well. And just wanted to plug really quickly that uh, we're also moving forward with the Green River uh, Levy Project, Milwaukee 2. This is the segment that moves from Foster Park uh, and east uh, along the Green River Trail upstream. Um, we have approximately $1.5 million that King County Parks uh, has allocated through their most recent levy for the Green River Trail. And so we would be implementing those dollars combined with some of the work that's uh, proposed for Milwaukee too. So next slide, please. Collaboration also extends to the work that we do with the Economic and Community Development Department. Um, we work with them on all sorts of things that are coming through their permit system. But in addition to that, uh, we are working hand in hand with them on the Meet Me on Meeker uh, projects. Uh, because we are park professionals, we very much take care in landscape design. We have a lot of experience with landscape design and implementation. And so we're helping in, in terms of reviewing the landscape components of that project. Um, both on the ground and in the design studio. So helping as, as we can on those projects to facilitate that implementation. We're also working on uh, recreation facilities code amendment, as Brian had mentioned earlier, as development comes in and, and they take uh, these parcels and replat them uh, for the uh, development purposes, they can either provide on site recreation or they can pay a fee in lieu. When they provide on site recreation, oftentimes what we end up with is um, less than or substandard components that are going in because developers, uh, you know, they want to develop these uh, properties as cost efficiently as they can, but oftentimes what suffers in that is the, the longevity of those assets. And so we're looking to make some updates to the code that provides a little bit more guidance to developers in terms of standards for recreation that we have experience with and that we know are, are long lasting assets that are not going to deteriorate quickly after they're installed. So some, some minor up, updates that we're doing to that, working with ECD on that. We also played uh, a role in Rally the Valley. That's the plan I'm sure you all are very familiar with at this point uh, in terms of um, making recommendations. You know, the big punchline from that, from that plan was essentially, for the Parks Department anyways, was essentially that uh, we could uh, uh, look at the development of impact fees for the Industrial Valley. So that's something we're gonna be moving forward. You'll see the next item, park impact fees. That's something that will get wrapped into that study and looked at further in terms of whether or not there's potential to uh, develop impact fees for the Industrial Valley. But in addition to that, we did have, uh, it got kind of cut off here in the graphic in the upper right hand corner, but the Kent Valley Regional Trails Opportunity Study was a component of the Rally the Valley project where we took a deep dive into the trail assets that we have that move through the Industrial Valley, both the Inner Urban Trail and the Green River Trail, and looking at opportunities for us to leverage private development in a more significant way. So, you know, I, there's a lot of good analysis that's in that plan. I won't go into too much detail, but just to say that we're very much working with our Economic Community Development Department with their studies and trying to incorporate and, and combine our studies where possible. Uh, and then we got the park impact fee. Brian will talk a little bit about that. So with that, I know I kind of rushed through a lot of this content. There were some really good questions and dialogue. So I just wanted to get through it. So we've got some additional time. So Brian, I'll hand it back over to you. 
Thanks, Terry. And uh, as you can see, we have a ton going on. Um, again, that it's Terry and his team as a group of four, uh, tremendously productive. Um, their hands in all kinds of different projects um, all across the city. So um, lots of exciting things happening. So really next steps. Uh, we're, Terry mentioned the park impact fee study. We're getting a, a consultant on board right now to, to start that process. So you'll be hearing more about that in the coming months. Um, we're also, I can't believe it's time to update the park and open space plan, but uh, we are at that point where we're looking to start hiring a consultant to start the planning process for the 2022 and 2027 park and open space plan update. Really excited about it. We, we, obviously, we had a, a great plan last time that's really done amazing things for our city. We're excited to take that plan and, and make the next steps and incorporate, you know, what we've learned through the recreation programming plan. Um, and, and, and really expand on kind of some of the things we saw in the Raleigh Valley plan. And so it's a great opportunity uh, to update that plan and, and take it to the next level. And then finally, we uh, will be completing our six year CIP plan through the 21 22 budget process as part of the kind of recent COVID um, related budget exercise. We looked at the, the next few years of our parks capital budget, but uh, we haven't had really had the opportunity to look at the next six years of um, CIP. So we'll be updating that. And so um, with that, I'm sorry, I apologize for going over, um, just lots going on, lots of interesting stuff. So, so i open it up for any additional questions. Thank you so much, Brian and Terry. Great information. Really exciting to see some of the cool things that we're doing in our parks that are not be, being done anywhere else. So that's really exciting. Council Member Fincher, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Has word gone out? I don't remember seeing anything. They've known it's coming for a long time, but the closing of Van Doren's, of Van Doren Landing, just thinking about all of the birthday parties, games, you know, the historical significance, all that has gone along with that park. Just thinking some people might want to pay a last visit to it before it shuts down. So have we posted that? Yeah, social media? yeah we've actually been working on that this week. We're gonna we're gonna start rolling that out next week. So um, yeah, we, we definitely want to let people know and um, it is a big milestone. And it, it is, you know, I think people love the existing park, people love the new park, but uh, yeah, definitely won't want to give people the opportunity to go out and say goodbye to the park. And Thank it's great. you. Council Member Thomas, did you have a question? I do. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Brian and Terry, you've got a fairly large parcel of land on 132nd between Kent Kangley and the Middle Road, also known as 256. Um, it's totally undeveloped right now, and I'm sure it's, you know, for a much later project. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, so the one, I believe you're talking about the 132nd neighborhood park site. That's correct. And I just yeah. my, a lot of the neighbors have contacted me about just getting it mowed, so it'd be kind of a broad use as well. You know, I mean, just open field. Is that something that can be done? Uh, well, it's a, the site is really muddy and uh, kind of uneven. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure. Okay. Um, if if but it is, it is a project that's on our, still on our list. Um, I think, again, as we go through the park impact fee discussion, I think that's um, one of the things we're hoping could help pay for some of those new facilities that I, I know we have, I think, had need for for a very long time and promised for a very long time. But um, given our capital budget situation, you know, the, the idea of developing a new park just hasn't really been a, a realistic proposition. So. so is there wetlands on the western portion of that? Yeah, there are wetlands okay. on that side. And so it, it will be trickier now to develop than when we initially um, acquired it. Okay. Uh, we haven't we haven't done any extensive uh, exploration of that property recently. So, um, you know, like, like I said, we, we're really trying to focus on the on the backlog of renovating our existing parks. And um, but, you know, definitely would love to get to that project. I, I guess if I could ask if the upper portion then could be mowed because it's dry, but I'm just throwing that out because I know I get several calls on this. Yeah, I know I know we try to mow it um, periodically just to kind of keep up with invasives and everything. Um, it's high right now. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, we, we've had, we're just now getting our seasonal staff on board for park operations. So we're, we're behind in quite a few areas. Um, and obviously we're focusing more on our developed parks first and making sure that as people are using our parks and um, you know, need a, really need our park system more than ever now. Um, so we have fallen a little behind on some of those rough mowing things, but we're, we're looking to catch up over the next couple months as we get our staffing back up to full levels. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Brian or Terry? 
All right, thank you so much. Great presentation, I appreciate the time. Um, moving on, the other um, item in our agenda is the SKIP briefing. And SKIP stands for South King Housing and Homeless Partners. So I'd like to welcome, um, I believe it's the new executive manager for SKIP, which is Angela Sanfilippo. And this is Marina Hansen also. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to just do a quick introduction um, on Angela's behalf. Um, as Council President Troutner said, South Keene Housing and Homelessness Partners um, is here tonight. We know it's been a while since you've been updated on this project, so I just wanted to give a quick recap. Most of the time we, we refer to it as SKIP, um, and it's much less of a mouthful, so I'm going to do that starting now. Um, it's a partnership between Kent, eight other South King County cities and King County, um, and it was formed to collaborate and share resources really to address the regional housing needs. So tonight um, you will be primarily hearing from our executive manager, Angela Sanfilippo. She is our first dedicated staff member since we adopted that interlocal back in 2019. Um, some of you will remember that it was a very long hiring process, but definitely well worth the wait. This was a position that had um, a very unique skill set that we needed, and we are very lucky that um, we stuck with it and were able to hire Angela. Um, she, <laughs> she's had quite a year because she came on board shortly before the COVID crisis hit, as well as relocated to this area for this position. So she's she's had a very big year so far, but she's been really great at getting um, everybody to continue the momentum on this project. So tonight she will be providing an overview of the SKIP work plan, um, as well as proposed future contributions. And this is really just meant to update you on where we are at and give you an opportunity as council members to provide some feedback and ask some questions prior to us coming back for formal adoption um, later this summer. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna pass it on over to Angela now. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. I appreciate that. Good evening, Mayor, Council President, and Council Members. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, this is a little bit different because I'm introducing myself for the first time virtually. Um, so I appreciate you bearing with us and um, certainly it's interesting times, as Marina said, starting a new job and, and relocating to an area, um, but really exciting work. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to come here and just provide a little bit of background into um, SKIP and the work that has been done um, through 2019, as well as the actions that SKIP is focusing on in 2020 and 2021. So as Marina kind of talked about, um, SKIP is the result of many years, over a decade of um, hard work and effort by South King County cities, elected officials, um, and housing advo advocacy groups with the mission of increasing available options for South King County community members to not only access affordable housing, but to pr preserve the existing affordable housing stock in South King County. Next slide, the key priorities to help SKIP achieve that mission are to provide a unified voice for South King County jurisdictions, developing shared solutions throughout the jurisdictions for what are really regional housing needs, and ensuring our neighbors can not only stay in their homes, but stay in the region and serve the most vulnerable populations in the area. The next slide, this is the brief overview of the milestones that occurred in 2019. This one slide is meant to summarize um, what was included in your packet tonight uh, as the 2019 end of the year report. And this is just to highlight some of the milestones that happened in 2019 in terms of getting SKIP in place. Um, all of these um, were made possible by monthly SKIP executive board meetings, as well as monthly SKIP staff work group meetings. Each of the 10 partner jurisdictions have representation on the SKIP executive board, as well as on the, SKIP's, the SKIP staff work group. Um, and they were really instrumental in getting this um, work in place and completing these milestones. 
the interlocal agreement that formalized the partnership became effective in January, but really took several months into 2019 for all 10 jurisdictions to approve and sign the interlocal agreement. Midway through 2019, the city of Auburn, as one of the SKIP partners, took on the administrative duties, filling a very important role for the ensuing hiring process, as well as budget development and convening meetings and establishing meeting agendas and other administrative related tasks. In July, the executive board agreed on some overarching action items that would inform Skip's first work plan when staff was um, came on board. And I'm gonna get into that work plan here in a little bit. In October, six of the nine Skip partner cities came together to jointly work on a sub-regional housing needs and policy assessment that was made possible by grant funding through House Bill 1923. And Skip was able to become the fiscal agent, which really helped to solidify that partnership and make sure that that work was able to move forward um, from an administrative standpoint. Um, and we remain involved in that work um, as it has moved forward. Throughout the second half of 2019, the Skip partner cities have advocated to enable legislation to accept sales tax credits made possible by another bill that was passed in 2019, House Bill 1406. And in November, the SKIP board unanimously passed a resolution that encouraged each of the SKIP partner cities to pool those funds to establish a regional housing capital fund for South King County. So this was really taking advantage of an opportunity to establish a housing fund that was really seen as a long-term goal for SKIP, but really brought that at the forefront because it was a recapturing of sales tax and not um, having to um, dig into existing city budgets. And we are still in the process of working on that. And I'll go into that a little bit more in the work plan itself. And then at the end of the year, um, SKIP, um, the, the hiring process was um, completed and um, I came on board in January of 2020. The next slide starts getting into um, a little bit of the timeline of the work plan as well as the budget development. Um, you'll see these years are a little bit different. It's the 2020 to 2021 work plan and the 21 to 22 budget. Um, the 2020 work plan was, or the 2020 budget was adopted as part of the interlocal agreement. Um, so these are a little bit offset, but this is the overall timeline for both of those. Um, we are, I am in the process of presenting and reviewing the work plan with SKIP partners before formal SKIP executive board adoption this summer which is followed by individual jurisdiction adop adoption in late summer or early fall. That is as required and outlined in the interlocal agreement. Next slide, we'll start getting into an overview of the work plan. This was also um, provided to you in the packet is the full work plan. So I am just gonna provide a summary um, of the work plan that's split into three work areas. The first one being governance and administration. This includes some program-wide management activities, startup procedures, developing the budget, as well as the annual work plan, and then also establishing an advisory committee that will inform the executive board's future decisions. The, measure, the outcomes of this um, area of work include establishing clear measures of progress and success as SKIP moves forward, and then also ensuring equitable outcomes across the region. And this really ties back to the advisory committee and bringing the necessary voices into the decision-making process. Next slide, the second area of work is policy and planning related. This includes advocating for the SKIP Housing Capital Fund and also developing an administration program for that fund. And that goes back to the pooling of those 1406 funds, which we are um, still currently in the process of um, advocating for and establishing um, commitment from each of the SKIP partners to pool those funds. 
This also includes establishing an inventory of subsidized and naturally occurring affordable housing that's vulnerable to market pressures in South King County. This will help to inform um, and prioritize um, the work around preservation of affordable housing in the area. And then this also includes collaborating across the jurisdictions on programs and policies that will help to protect housing stock and provide housing security and access to South King County community members. Some of the outcomes of this area are, of work include increased resources that are dedicated to affordable housing in South King County. So this not only um, is about um, pooling those 1406 funds and establishing the housing capital fund, but leveraging those funds to significantly increase the investment in housing in South King County. This also includes the, an increased number of South King County cities with housing action plans that ties back to the grant funded House Bill 1923 work that's being done and um, also includes the number of jurisdictions with new or enhanced legislation um, that supports affordable housing strategies. The last area of work is around outreach and education. This includes making sure that um, South King County is represented at local and regional decision-making tables and forums, increasing understanding of our regional stakeholders as well as our decision-makers in the area around housing needs and the range of opportunities in South King County. And then also includes developing annual advocacy priorities for state and federal legislators. So the outcomes here are really making sure that South King County is heard and considered and supported by local as well as regional and state decision makers. Um, this also includes potential changes in policies and practices and funding streams that significantly benefit South King County and increased interest from nonprofit and for-profit developers um, for housing in South King County. Next slide is an overview um, a very basic overview of what we're looking at for the 2021 and 2022 budget with regard to the jurisdiction contributions that make up the SKIP operational budget. And I really just wanted to take an opportunity to go over what will be coming back for formal adoption. Um, and we saw some significant personnel cost savings in 2019 and 2020 with regard to SKIP's operational budget because of the timing um, and hiring of staff. Um, as I indicated, the executive manager position was not hired until the beginning of 2020, but was budgeted for in 2019. We also have a second staff position that has been budgeted for, um, but has not been hired and will likely be hired this fall as a three quarter time position. Um, the reasoning behind that is to make sure that we can maintain our current jurisdiction contributions through 2022, while also making sure that we can move forward with the work plan and ensure implementation and um, measurable progress being made as we move forward. So you'll see the city of Kent um, let me step back one minute. Um, the table there just shows the um, contributions, which are split up by um, the size of the jurisdiction based on population. So the city of Kent at over 100,000 has an annual contribution of $34,000 a year. And we are proposing that that be maintained through 2022 without any increase to that over the next couple years. Next slide. The last thing I wanted to just touch on briefly, um, because I think it's really important to recognize um, our existing how existing crisis with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to think about um, where we were before the pandemic hit and the housing crisis that we were already experiencing, um, even before the economic impacts of this current COVID-19 pandemic. So you'll see prior to COVID-19, a third of households were experiencing cost burden, which means they were paying more than 30% of their annual income on housing related costs. We also were seeing underproduction of housing for almost a decade, which means King County's population was greater than the housing production that was occurring. 
and wages were not keeping pace with the increased housing cross, costs across the region. We also saw disproportionate impacts um, in terms of cost burden, renters and people of color are significantly more likely to be paying um, more than half of their income on housing. Um, when someone is paying more than half of their income on housing, start thinking about what kind of sacrifices they're making in terms of other necessary costs, um, education, food, um, transportation, all of those things that are not factored into that. Next slide. Um, this are this is some likely scenarios, and I, I apologize. I wanted to just say that both of these were brought up in the affordable housing committee meeting um, in May by King County. So I thought they did a really good job of highlighting um, the potential impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and just summarizing um, our current housing conditions prior to the pandemic. So some of the likely scenarios um, given the current um, conditions, um, and I don't share this um, as um, a mechanism to increase anybody's anxiety, but rather to ground the work that um, each of the cities are doing and the partnership that SKIP um, affords each of those jurisdictions to work on and move forward. Um, so some of these likely scenarios are potential increases in cost burden. Housing supply was so low to begin with that home prices are not likely to go down as part of the current recession, um, which will potentially increase cost burden because of uh, the economic impacts that we're seeing on individual households. Also increasing those disproportionate impacts on our vulnerable populations because of the disproportionate impacts um, of the COVID-19 pandemic itself. And then also potential for our immediate crisis response while absolutely necessary could pull attention away from those long-term needs. So just really wanted to um, think about the context of where we were at with the housing crisis prior to this current pandemic and um, those things still really being important in the work that um, SKIP does. Um, the economic impacts and the job losses of the coronavirus pandemic make the need for housing for all families an even more critical issue throughout the region. And the long-term policy state changes, establishing local funding sources for affordable housing, and the coordination and collaboration that I went over as part of SKIP's overall mission and work plan are more crucial than ever to help address housing affordability across South King County. With that, I think the next slide is just my contact information and I'm happy to answer any questions you have or um, feedback that you might have on the work plan or the proposed budget. Great. Thank you so much, Marina, for the introduction and Angela, welcome. Um, Council Member Boyce, do you have a question or a comment? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I didn't want to say welcome, Angela. That was very outstanding presentations. I really appreciate that. Hey, two slides ago, you mentioned something about 244,000 affordable housing needed. I think that's the number I saw right yes, now. Yes, that's well, correct. How, how do you define affordable, affordable home? How do you define that? So that number came out of the Regional Affordable Housing Task Force um, that King County worked on. And that number is um, affordable homes based on an income of 80% or okay. below of the area median income for the county. And okay. those are the number that they um, estimated would be needed to meet the existing need as well as the projected population growth by the year 2040. Okay, thank you very much once again. And I look forward to meeting you as well too, but uh, I really appreciate your presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Right. Any other questions or comments from colleagues? All right. I'm not seeing any mics come on or any hands being raised. So thank you again. What a great presentation. Thank um, you all for having me. I would just say my contact information is there. Feel free to reach out to me um, if you do have any feedback or questions moving forward. And I do look forward to meeting you at some point in our future um, in person. So thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to that. Thank you. All right. So that brings us to the end of our workshop. Thank you to everyone that has joined us this evening. We will be back shortly for the council meeting. Thanks, everybody.
they're getting a little antsy sometimes in the meeting. How long is this meeting again? You said um, an hour. Oh, darn, we only had 10. 